Welcome to the Bronx Latino History Project. My name is Stephen Payne, Director of the Bronx County Historical Society. Today is August 15th, 2024, and I'm honored to be here with Dr. Peretta Rodriguez, a lifelong civil rights activist, community organizer, um, a accomplished professional. I mean, there, there's many things that could be said about Dr. Rodriguez, um, but we'll let Dr. Rodriguez speak for herself today. So why don't you begin by telling us a little bit about your family history and background and eventually getting to the story of what led your family to move to New York City and the Bronx. Okay, well, I'm a lifelong uh, Bronx, Bronxite. I've been, I was born in Lincoln Hospital on February the 4th, 1936. So I've got a lot of years of experience and I've been an advocate as well as an active participant in a lot of things that have occurred in the Bronx as well as in Manhattan. My mother and father are, orig are from Puerto Rico. My mother is from Manatee, and my father is from um, really Rio Piedras. Okay. Um, I probably will emphasize more in terms of my mother because I was closest uh, sure. to my mother's side of the family. Um, my mother's side of the family are the uh, poets, the writers, and uh, some business people. My father's side is basically uh, business, and um, I think we have one doctor and one uh, psychologist. I myself am a psychotherapist. It means that I'm a social worker with advanced degrees in psychology as well in social welfare. Um, my mother and father uh, came to the United States at a very early age. My mother was 16, and I think my father well, my, no, um, my mother was maybe around 14, 15 years old. Okay. And my father was 17. Uh, they met in Manhattan uh, at the park, Central Park, where most Puerto Ricans at that time were meeting. Sure. Central Park on 106th Street, um, you know, on Fifth Avenue. The park there was a, a meeting grounds for everybody. My mother has had six sisters. Um, I think four of them came to the United States, uh, the rest stayed in Puerto Rico, and she had one brother that came uh, here uh, to New York City and was, I think he tried to get into one of the colleges, and it was a disaster, mm -hmm. and he uh, couldn't take the racism at that point. And so he returned to Puerto Rico, and he never stepped foot again in the United States, never. My mother was a union organ. Well, she came here, and she had um, a, about an elementary school background and education because her family were, her father was, had a business, a, a meat business, meat uh, so meat, like a butcher shop or something like that. Yeah, butcher shop and meat shop, uh, and he also had a furniture shop. Oh wow! Okay. So, um, but my grandmother, well, she was a homemaker, and that's all she did. But however, she was very advanced because uh, she ended up having several houses in Puerto Rico that she rented. She bought and rented mostly in uh, Barrio Obrero. Okay. That's where we're really from. And the, the home base was 505, Calle Martino, uh -huh. Barrio Obrero, Santurce, Puerto Rico. And they were very, very proud of being Puerto Ricans. Uh, we were, even myself, I was sure. very proud to be a Puerto Rican. Well, my mother and father came separately to the United States. Uh, as I said before, they met uh, at the park, at Central Park on 106th Street. Um, the the grounds there with the flowers and everything it's sure. really very beautiful it is uh, my mother was a, a started out in the garment industry she had come from puerto rico and she was brought she went to school with the nuns there uh -huh. and they uh taught her how to do tacking and sewing and i think uh crocheting so when she came to the uh, to new york city she had some skills in terms of uh, sewing. And so, uh, and a lot of the Italian women at that point 
took her under their belt. Not all of them, but there were some that were very open, and they took her under their uh, wing, and they learned. They taught her how to uh, really sew, how to cut material, and so she ended up being a, a sample maker. The sample maker is the highest um, rank in terms of sewing, because they're the ones that cut the patterns mm. that uh, produces the dresses, gowns, everything else that uh, are sold in the store. And uh, the sample maker makes corrections in terms of uh, the sewing and uh, any difficulties or uh, mistakes that the designer has made or has left out. So uh, she worked during the um, Depression didn't make a lot of money, but made money and was able to, you know, my mother and father were able to put food on the table. My mother, uh, during that time, probably had jobs uh, that were, as I said, uh, she was they weren't unionized yet, uh -huh. but they were moving towards that area. My father, on the other hand, was an organizer at well, and he worked with um, his uh, brother-in-law down on 23rd Street, East 20, no, West 23rd Street. And um, he would always say to his uh, um, uh, in-law, Moncho, you see, that's the, uh, the Flatiron Building. That's a very famous building. And he would tell my father that every time they passed, <laughs> you know, to went to work. And so my uncle would get very angry with him and said, I know already, Jimmy, don't keep repeating the same story. <laughs> but they were very proud of that building and they were very proud to be in New York City. Um, they had come here, uh, not indentured, but that they had their family support in terms of coming here. Huh. And my mother did very well uh, in the garment district. Uh, and she was, a, as I said, a union organizer. So she would be uh, organizing, and the boss would say, Gracie, that's it, out. And she would tell him, oh, don't worry about it. You'll call me in a month's time because you're going to need me. Oh, no, I'm not going to call you. I'm not going to call you. And sure enough, uh -huh. one month later, they would call, Gracie, could you come back to work? But don't organize. <laughs> and she said, well, I'm going to come, and I will work, but I can't promise you anything. So, you know, she kept in the uh, garment industry until she sort of got tired of it. Um, she worked in the garment industry, I would say, maybe about 20 years. Wow. And my father at that point worked at first as um, a factory laborer in a uh, factory that produced steel cabinets and um, bookcases and uh, file cabinets. And then they, he saved enough money and ended up uh, setting up his own bar business. And the bar was in Manhattan at first, and they would be serving drinks and then food. And they moved to, um, they moved to the Bronx. Well, they first, I was born in the Bronx, but we, they, I lived in uh, Astoria for about I'm not sure, maybe five or six, uh, until I was five years old when sure. we moved to the Bronx. And we moved to 156th Street on Fox Street, which has changed tremendously. I don't even recognize it anymore. Absolutely. But it was uh, buildings. We always lived on the top floor, except one time when we lived on the first floor. Um, my mother never liked living on the first floor. But she would be the one that would find the apartments. I remember one time we went with, I went with her, and we went to this uh, private house uh, because they advertised that they had, um, I think, three bedrooms. Um, and uh, but when my mother when my mother went and knocked on the door and the woman answered, she said, "No, we don't rent to Puerto Ricans." Mm -hmm. And so um, and my mother said, "Well, I don't really want to live here anyway. I just came because uh, of the advertisement." Uh, that was what, how she was. She wasn't going to take anything from anyone. Sure. And she always had a response back. My father was the type of man, everybody loved him. Because he just never, he, he was very intelligent, would be furious 
but you would never really know. Mm -hmm. You'd have to do something to him so dramatic that he would lose his temper. And he very seldom lo lost his temper, but my mother was very different. Uh, my mother didn't take anything from anyone, and uh, she gave it as much as she got. Uh, and I remember, although they don't, they, they don't say this, she was a union organizer, and I remember one time she came home with a black eye. Mm -hmm. And I had asked her why, and she said, well, I disagreed with someone and we were organizing, okay? So, um, and as I said, uh, originally my father's f father was from um, Sanobria in Spain, and my mother's mother came from Las Islas Canarias in oh, Spain, okay. and then they, the, the family moved to Puerto Rico. Uh, when my, my grandmother was very fair, very, very fair, white, you could yeah. say, uh, with, you know, dark uh, brown, blonde hair. I only met her once when she was in her, she must have been around her 60s or 70s. It was after World War II when we were able to uh, take a ship or plane to Puerto Rico and I went with my cousin to Puerto Rico and we met my grandmother and I met my father's family as well at that point. My grandma was very fair and very frail, uh, very sharp, and as I said, she had uh, saved, she had houses, she had two or three houses that she was renting uh, in Barrio My grandmother on my father's side was very uh, tall uh, and well-built husky, more Taino sure. than uh, my mother's side. And, um, she had several children as well. They both had more than six children. Some died, but they had large families and um, they did very well. My grandmother had her own house um, in Rio Piedras because her husband, my father's father, worked for the uh, government of Spain in Puerto Rico at that point. And so they had a house on the plaza. My mother's side, they had a house in, as I said, in Cinco Cero Cinco, Calle Martino, Barrio Obrero. And uh, my, my grandfather on my mother's side also had saved money and had his own business. So this was, that was the background of both my mother and father. So when they came to New York City, they already had that kind of a background. Uh, and they were able to, I would say, manage New York City at that time much better than a lot of other Puerto Ricans that came later. Sure. Um, I can't remember my, I, what uh, the year that my mother came here, I, I can't, I don't really remember and I don't have that information. Sure. No, when my father came, I don't have that information. But I do have the information that I, as I said, was born at Lincoln Hospital, but we moved to Astoria and we lived in the projects there, uh -huh. uh, which was very difficult to get into, and really were very nice, and they're still very nice, um, a nice area to live in. Uh, then, uh, you know, we went to, I think we did a short, they did a short time in Manhattan, mm. and then we moved to the Bronx. And the, old, the I remember the Bronx in terms of living on 156th Street and Fox Avenue. Sure. Um, Fox Street, rather, Fox Street. and uh, going to PS62. And when I went to PS62, I was in the Rapids class, um, and I remember one teacher, her name was Mrs. McLaughlin, and she uh, said to me, Peretta, I'm going to teach you how to get rid of your accent. I didn't know I had an accent, but she said I had an accent. So, um, and I remember she had me read uh, from Shakespeare, I can't read the uh, speak the speech I pray you. And so I would do it every night, speak the speech I pray you, trippingly on your tongue. <laughs> and um, my, I, I would sit at the table with my mother and my mother would listen to it. And then if I said anything wrong or I forgot something, she would say, no, trippingly on the tongue. <laughs> and I would say, what? <laughs> so I would remember. And anyway, Miss McLaughlin succeeded. I evidently lost my accent, and now I have a New York 
Bronx accent, <laughs> which other people hear, but I don't hear it. Sure. Um, then I can't be, well, we went, I went from uh, um, elementary school, a PS 62, to junior high school, which was basically, I mean, in, in 62, I think I was the only Puerto Rican in the class, sure. or in, even in the school. And I know in the Catholic school, I was the only Puerto Rican, of, and there must have been about 400 students. So and the, the Catholic uh, school that was, was that in period Astoria? of time. What? The Catholic school was in Astoria that you went yeah, to? Yeah. 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 And the Bronx, uh, PS62, had a few blacks, but very few. It, I always felt that I was the only Puerto Rican, sure. especially in the special classes. Was it mostly I, Irish and Jews? Yeah, I, mostly Irish and Jews. And in um, junior high school, there were a lot more uh, African Americans, but it was heavily uh, Jews and Irish. Uh, um, which junior high school was it? Junior high school 60, which okay. was on Intervale Avenue. Sure. Okay. Um, so I went there and I, I guess I did okay. Uh, I remember one time that um, the teacher took us to, um, I think it was near the Bronx Zoo. Okay. And there was a Howard Johnson there. And that was the first time I ever had ice cream cake. Uh -huh. This was an exception to, I mean, it was, I remember that ice cream cake because I had never eaten cakes like that. Most of the food, I think you had asked me, most of my food was Spanish. Sure. Arroz con gandules, mm -hmm. chicken. We had chicken 365 <laughs> days in the year, not 300. I mean, every Sunday, my mother went to one of her sister's house. My mother was not a very good cook, but her sister's, there was only one uh, aunt that was, was worse, a worse cook than my mother. And we never went to her house to eat. But we always ended up going either to my aunt's house um, that was immediately uh, older than my mother, or the two aunts had the best, they were the best cooks. So we would get to go to their house and they served chicken every Sunday. I had chicken all types of shapes, forms, and and and, and menu style. I mean, from fried to uh, uh, guisau to, uh -huh. to ev ev but it was chicken to the point where now I never have chicken outside of uh, in a restaurant. I either eat it at my house or I eat it at a friend's house reluctantly. But I never order chicken in the restaurant. Sure. Never. Um, so I remember, you know, we had a very close-knit family. Um, as I said, my mother had one, two, three, four sisters here and herself. Well, she was one of the four. Uh, and my mother was the youngest of all of them, okay? So she was a little bit spoiled uh, by her other sisters. Uh, and one sister was also, um, it was she worked commercially, and one aunt was a businesswoman, uh -huh. even at that time. Uh, she had her oh. own bar wow. uh, and a restaurant business. And uh, basically, she had a bar on 104th Street and Madison Avenue uh -huh. uh, in Manhattan, which was lost because she didn't pay the taxes. So that, that was lost. And Mount Sinai is now in that, uh, in that area <laughs> with yes. some of the most luxurious uh, hospital, um, uh -huh. you know, as well as apartments. Um, and my father had a bar on 110th Street and Madison Avenue, and that went very well. From there, they, he went to uh, the Bronx with my aunt, and they had a bar on underneath the, the I think it's the number two train, oh, okay. close to Prospect Avenue and Tinton. Oh, okay, sure, yeah, sure, so sure. Where I'm a Brax person uh, completely, and um, he, he, that business did very well. From there, they he went. To, he opened up a business later on in his life as a um, a distributor in Manhattan on West 125th Street. He had a, a liquor store there that was selling liquor and beer and everything else. Sure. Um, this was, of course, once he set up his own business uh, through savings. Um, 
what else? Sure. So just spending a little more time on your on your mom and dad and, and their family, um, when they came to New York, did they settle in El Barrio or did they settle, you know, in Brooklyn and then move to El Barrio or the Lower East Side? Do you know that story? Yeah. Well, in um, one aunt moved uh, to... She always lived in Manhattan, in East Harlem. At that point, it was a hundred and I think it was a hundred and second street between Lexington and Park Avenue South. First, she lived on the uh, west side of Park Avenue, but always so we always heard the trains coming, going through the tunnel, and then she lived on the east side of it, which was a hundred and second between. Uh, Lexington Avenue and um, and Park Avenue, huh. and uh, it was a nice area, you sure. know. And my mother, uh, we would go there on Sundays to eat. My, we were living in the Bronx at that point, and once we moved to the Bronx, we just stayed in the Bronx. Sure. I sure. mean, I lived on Manida Street. I lived on uh, Lafayette Street. I lived on Fox Street, on uh -huh. um, St. Anne Street. Um, we lived a lot of, we moved a lot in terms of, uh, you know, living in the Bronx. Uh, so that was all of it. And uh, my other aunt, she went from Manhattan and uh, she, either, she always lived either in Queens um, or basically in Queens, in Sunnyside and in, uh, what is it? Um, oh where uh, Macy's and, uh, and and the other, uh, on Queens Boulevard. Oh, on Queens Boulevard. Yeah, uh, okay, okay. It, was, um, the, it was the um, Metropolitans. Park Chester was in, in Brooklyn, but they had a place in oh, Queens yeah, on yeah, Jamaica. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't think of, the, on Queens Boulevard and something. That's where my, my, uh, my aunt lived. And then she had a business both in Queens, and then she moved in terms of having a business in uh, Brooklyn. Wow. So she was a businesswoman way before her time, okay? Absolutely. And then um, my, my mother had one brother who moved, who was lived in the Bronx, and he uh, is the grandfather. Willie Colon is uh, his grandfather. Uh, was my mother's brother. So my mother nice. was Willie Colon's family, and uh -huh. I only bring that up because uh, he made a good, he made a name for himself, and I remember him uh, at 14 when he uh, became the first, uh, he, had a, he had a band at 14 uh, with men o much older than him Absolutely. Uh, because he was a trombonist, and he was very, very original at that point. Uh, his mother was my cousin, and Arakalong, and um, she lived on, they lived on near Brook Avenue, and we were living on St. Anne's Avenue. Uh -huh. So we were, you know, they had much more relationship than uh, some of the other families. Sure. But I had one, and we had one aunt uh, who had, who started on Tinton Street uh, with a grocery store, and she and her husband saved enough money to buy a house in Holbrook, New York, oh, wow. Holbrook, Queens, or Long Island, Holbrook, Long Island. And what they did was um, they bought a house there and we would go there a couple of Sundays uh, to, you know, spend the weekend, get out of the city a little bit. Sure. And um, my aunt never worked, so, but her husband, oh, first of all, they worked in the grocery store together then in Queens, uh, not in Queens, in, Suff in Suffolk County in Holbrook, he worked for, um, I think, a mental institution. So he was able to, you know, bring in money. And then, um, but two of the sisters were homemakers, housewives. One was a nurse, uh, but she had some mental issues and mm -hmm. so... Uh, she didn't work very long at that profession, but returned to Puerto Rico for her brother to take care of her. Uh, this was uh, another brother. So my mother had two brothers, not one, two brothers, and the rest were sisters. Uh -huh. um, and they, we mostly, 
there were only, I think my, my mother was the only one that lived in the Bronx. The rest of them lived in Queens or Manhattan uh -huh. or out in um, Queens, I meant, you know, um, Sunnyside. Sure. Or um, I can't remember what the name of this complex is, where it's basically Jewish still to this point. And it's, uh, it, I mean, it's, it's mammoth. Rochdale, uh, the, the Rochdale? Um, I can't remember. Okay, yeah. It'll come to me. And uh, but on the summertime, it looks like a whole bunch of ants coming out of the building <laughs> because uh, that's the population was there. Sure. And um, and but it was a lovely area. My aunt had she had had a nice apartment. So um, basically, that was them. Uh, the only ones that were on public assistance for a short period of time was my aunt that lived in Manhattan on Park Avenue, in Manhattan on 102nd Street between uh, Lexington and Park Avenue South. Sure. Uh, she was on public assistance maybe about two or three years when her husband got very sick and he was not able to work. Um, but the rest of the family basically uh, worked on their own business or just worked and had some kind of profession that that's where they were. Sure, sure. We're but basically, our food was Spanish, Puerto Rican, basically. Um, in fact, we very seldom had steak. If I had sure. a steak once every two years, that was a miracle. Absolutely. And the only time we um, had, I do remember that my, my father was a better cook. I mean, he could make spaghettis and he could make all kinds of dishes. And he usually did, but basically we stayed having Puerto Ricans, but I know Puerto Rican food, a menu rather. But I remember one time when I was living in St. Anne's Avenue, my father had made friends with this Irish huh. uh, family that lived in the same building towards the back. And all of a sudden I came home one day uh, and we all, my brother and I were smelling, what's that? And he had made um, corned beef Corn beef, and corn, beef. Corn, beef corn beef and cabbage. Corn beef and cabbage. Uh -huh. It was delicious. Yeah. But that's the first time we ever had anything really very different. Corn beef and cabbage. And my father would make that every once in a while, which I enjoyed greatly. But uh, the main menu was mainly chicken, sometimes lamb, uh -huh. definitely pork. And um, so other meats. Uh, steak was just too expensive and not only that, but it wasn't in our menu. Absolutely. And um, what's the other one? Um, anyway, some of the other American uh, menus we never had. Sure, sure. I, we sell them. Very few times did we have potatoes. Sure. That was not on the menu. Sweet potatoes was different, but basically rice. Rice, sure. sweet potatoes, uh, sometimes other potatoes, uh, but uh, not not uh, you know uh, American pota mashed potatoes. For sure. instance, we never had mashed potatoes uh, and French fries. My mother used that was the one uh, dish that she could make spectacularly, mm. uh, uh, French fries. But we mostly had home fries. Sure. Okay, but that was our menu, and we never had, um, I, I never remember having uh, popcorn, ice cream, uh -huh. uh, all this junk food that you have now. We never had that. That, sure. that, well, that was a luxury. Uh, candy, I would get once a year. Uh, my grandmother from Puerto Rico, my mother's, my father's mother, would send me jars of um, pineapple, uh, uh, mango, mm. uh, or, uh, orange marmalade. Uh -huh. I mean, I would get jars of that for Christmas, and that lasts me the whole year. Sure. We never had ice cream. That was just that was never included in our menu. But we never had cakes. You know, sure. uh, because in Puerto Rico, they did not oven they didn't use the oven because it was too hot absolutely so the cakes and things like that was not very common but all the uh, tembleque all of the uh -huh. kind of um desserts that we had tembleque or um flan uh -huh. uh pineapple dishes um rum cake 
I'm, oh, I can't think of some others. Those were, you know, the, those were on the menu, but cheesecake and everything else, that was not on the menu. Sure, too costly, absolutely. Um, so I, I, I want to ask you more about, um, you know, stores and, vin uh, stores and vendors and all you remember in the Bronx. But before we get there, let's just spend a little time in Queens. And why don't you share some of your earliest memories in Queens? And also you can touch on... Um, uh, the Catholic school that you had to go to in Queens and um, the stories you were sharing before we Well, started. as I said, the, the Catholic school in Queens, I still remember where it was, but uh, now I can't think of the address. But uh, I had to take a bus, and my mother would talk to the bus drivers and say, my daughter has to get, she gets on this stop, and she gets off on that stop. Please make sure that she just gets off at that stop because I have to work. And at that time, you know, you had bus drivers that were conscientious uh -huh. and they would do that, you know. So I, that was pretty very good. And um, the school, the, the Catholic school that I went to was close to Cavalry Cemetery. Uh, okay. And Cavalry Cemetery is where my mother and family had a plot in terms of when, you know, to, bur to be buried. Um, but that was where the school was, and we lived uh, in uh, in Queens, uh, in the projects near more in Astoria. So it was a matter of taking one or two buses. I can't remember, but I was able to do that, and that sure. was pretty good. Um, but it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't. There was a lot of racism at that point, but I had a tremendous support from my mother and father. Um, they always melt, always corrected any um, any negative things that I would bring home or that I would say happened. And my father always said, "You're intelligent, and I expect you to work as diligently as you can. Sure. And uh, your job is to go to school. My job is to make sure." that you can go to school. Okay. And my mother had the same orientation. <clears throat> so in my family, we had teachers, we had um, social workers, basically teachers and social workers. And there was one, yes, one registered nurse, one registered nurse. And um, they've done very well. Um, I am now the survivor of most of my cousins um, at that point. Uh, so God, I've been fortunate that God has um, kept me living this long. So I have a lot of experience and a lot of memories. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, before we started recording, just to make sure that um, you share it on camera too, you mentioned where you sat in the <laughs> Catholic school classroom. I think it's important to make sure that's you know, on record and all. If you just want to share a little bit more about about that, well, I mean, I report to the class. You know, each year you went to a different class. So the first year, the second year, the third year, and as I said, I always ended up in the last row in the last seat, and I never really could understand that. Um, and then I just said, well, this is the way it is, and I'm going to leave it, alone, leave it alone. And my mother and father never contested that. Sure. Um, they felt that it was more important to uh, go to the school, get the education I wanted, and, and, and just leave whatever was going on in the school at the school. Um, but it did mean that I had to do my homework by myself, sure. and that sometimes presented a problem uh, because um, their schooling and mine was very different, uh -huh. um, and so that was not something that I uh, could depend on them to help me with. Uh, I, my brother, I was able to help him in terms of uh, schoolwork, um, and um, that in itself, uh, I was the oldest, so I would be protecting my brother, even though he was, you know, male. And um, sometimes uh, there, were, there were a couple of incidents where I had to uh, threaten other young men uh -huh, sure. who would be picking on my brother. Uh, 
so that they would not they would stop doing that. That's basically on Fox Street. Uh huh. When when you were in Queens, I know you were you were still pretty young or very young, really in Queens. But did you play out in the street very much, or what kinds of things did you do for fun? I really didn't play out in the street because out in the street because uh, first, first of all. My mother and father were working. Sure. And I, uh, my brother was not born at that point. And um, there was really no one to oversee me. Sure. So my mother said to me that once I got home, I was to stay home. I could hear the radio. Uh, you know, I could do my homework. Uh, I could start prepping things ready, uh, you know, for us to eat that night. But I never was uh, playing out in the street. Sure. Uh, once in a while, I'd play out in the park. And, um, you know, um, I was the darkest person in the, in the playground with uh -huh. curly hair, with curls. Uh, so, you know, there weren't too many kids that would play with me. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, when you moved, after you moved to the Bronx, I know you said your, your family moved around a lot. One thing that... that some people end up talking about, which I think is more or less, you know, not a thing anymore, is uh, their parents being smart enough to take advantage of the different uh, rent uh, deals that they would get from moving around. Do you know if, if that factored into your parents? That's, I have a feeling that that was happening because we'd mo we moved quite a few times. I mean, it, it among all my friends, I probably have moved the most, not only in when I was young, but in my middle age, and even when I'm, even as I'm, I've gotten older, I'm, where I'm living now at Fordham Hill Oval um, in the Bronx, I've been living there since 1986. That's incredible. Wow. I've never lived any place that long <laughs> in my life, uh, and I'll... <laughs> when we get into when I went, moved into when I moved to Washington D.C., uh -huh. even there I moved three times. Wow! Okay. So um, moving now, I it, when I move, it's really very different. But when my father and mother were moving, my mother was the one that would be, you know, she'd find the apartments. Okay, my father never did this because he was working at night uh, in his own business. So, uh, and I think my mother must must have been doing the same thing, taking advantage in terms of the differences in the rent and what she would get back and how much sure. less she would be paying, uh, or if she paid a little bit more, it was to get more room. Uh, but we always ended up living on the top floor, uh -huh. or only once I lived once one time on the first floor. My mother never liked living on the first floor. Yeah, yeah. Do you remember um, very many neighborhood stores or, or merchants that your family would go to on a regular basis? Well, there was a drugstore right on the corner of 156th Street on Fox. That's where we would go for medicines and everything. And uh, my mother would go to uh, La Marqueta uh -huh. in East Harlem uh, to buy uh, the, uh, the Spanish foods that she liked and everything. But she basically, when she was working, she always worked in Manhattan, uh, in different parts, in the garment industry, which was sure. on 100, and, no, which was on 40th Street uh, between 7th and usually 8th Avenue. Between uh -huh. 7th and 8th Avenue, that was the heart of the garment industry, from 40th Street all the way to, I would say, 33rd Street. Yeah. Uh, and that would be between 7th and uh, 7th and 8th Avenue, 7th yeah. and 8th Avenue, where all the garments uh, were made and where all, all the um, clothing stores, as well as the, um, what would you call them, um, fabrics and laces and everything was in that area. Sure. So that was where, where, and that's where really the International Ladies Garment Union, you know, started. Absolutely. My mother was always an organizer, so even when she moved, uh, when she started working at the uh, Metropolitan uh, Hospital, uh, she started, she was a union organizer for 11.99 as well. Huh. And uh, were your mother or father also um, 
political or doing other kinds of organizing outside the workplace as well? No, not really. My mother basically was a union organizer. My father was a union organizer. Um, they really didn't, they didn't organize outside of the unions. And sure. they didn't organize, let's say, in terms of schools or things like that. Sure. They never did that. My father always felt that um, um, he had, I, it doesn't come to me right now, but I meant um, he had this idea that school was where you went to learn and, <clears throat> and you were to um, practice what you learned and utilize what you learned. Sure. In fact, when I went to, um, I didn't, I went to City College because I didn't want to go to Hunter because my cousins were going to Hunter. Uh -huh. And I know that we, they would end up comparing, uh, you know, my marks with their marks. So I said, well, if I go to Hunt, if I go to City College, uh, the likelihood that they'll do that was not, you know, was very was very uh, rare. Sure. But I remember the first day that I left my house to go to college and I took the bus. We were living on St. Anne's Avenue and I had to take the bus, the Crosstown bus, uh, and it stopped on Convent Avenue in, in, um, in Manhattan. And I remember my father was working at night. But, uh, and he got up very early on my first day that I was going to college. And I was really very surprised. But before I walked out the door, my father's statement was, I'm paying for you to go to college, Peretta, to get a degree, not a husband. You can always get a husband, but you can't always get a degree. And once you get a degree, the door is open to you and you can pay your own way. You don't have to depend on anybody. Mm -hmm. that, was the, that was his statement as I opened the door wow. to go out the door to go to college. Wow, wow. And I still remember that. I even remember what he looked like and what he wore that day and I was very surprised. <laughs> but it made an impression on me. Wow, wow. Um, were either of your parents um, uh, affected during the McCarthy years. I know many union organizers, regardless of their politics, um, were, but... I don't think so. No, I, you know, um, I know that my father, in terms of the, of the garment industry, that was pretty rough. And they, uh, you know, because uh, Especially in Brooklyn, the, yeah. the the head of it, I can't remember, the head of the union lived in Brooklyn, like in Red Hook or uh, right, I don't know if it's Park Slope right there or Cobble Hill, but in that area. He lived in that area and it was pretty, pretty rough. Yeah. And my father was 6'3", uh, he was 6'3", very thin and fair. So he didn't. He wasn't your typical Puerto Rican in terms of uh, size. Sure. And as I said, my deme his demeanor was different. He was he got along with everybody, but um, but he, and he was a good organizer and very intelligent, and they respected him in terms of that. In fact, he was uh, for many time for for many many years when the. Um, the owner of, was it Patty's? No, in uh, East Harlem uh, on, oh, I can't remember, it, it, it'll come to me. It's, sure. oh, Rouse, oh, Rouse okay. Restaurant. My father had a relationship with Rouse, uh, the owner. And um, they would meet every once in a while and have coffee. My father would go to Rouse to have coffee. I think it was the only Puerto Rican ever able to go into Rouse. I don't think they ever served anybody else. Sure. You couldn't even make an appointment. You couldn't even make a reservation, rather. And I remember hearing that Madonna had made, wanted to go to Rouse because it was very famous in terms of the Italian dishes and everything. And Rao didn't let her come because he didn't like her outfits when she uh, would be performing. So uh -huh. she never got an invitation uh, or a reservation at Rouse to eat. And wow. my father would go there to have coffee, 
basically coffee. Sure, sure. Wow. <laughs> wow. Oh, what? yeah, Pleasant Street. It was on Pleasant uh, Street okay. and a hundred and maybe six or eight street, Pleasant Street, right before the, uh, it was the park. There was a playground uh, right next to it. But Rouse, I think they're still there. I'm not sure. I haven't been in that area in a long time, but it was the Italian section. Absolutely. Um, what about music in your household? What kinds of music? Uh, we do you only remember? had Spanish music. There's sure. no such thing as, as American music. Um, you know, we just didn't. Sure. But I do remember that when uh, the black and white television came, <laughs> we were the only family in the whole building that had a television. Wow. And a lot of the kids would come to my house. They're basically, my brother's friends would come to the house to watch television. Wow, wow. I used to listen to the radio, the Long Ranger and sure. some of these other, um, you know, uh, melodramas. Uh, but basically, you know, we, it was Spanish music. Sure, sure. Absolutely. Um, do you know if your parents ever, um, you know, maybe before you were born, went to the Palladium or places like that? No, my, uh, they never went there. Uh, I went, but my mother and father never went. They basically went to um, a Spanish, uh, what is it? there was a place on uh, on Broadway and a hundred and, where City College is, 135, uh, okay. 136. Sure. Uh, between 135th and 145th, there was some Spanish um, uh, dance halls, and sure. that's where uh, my mother would go with her sisters. My father was always working as either in his business, which was a bar, yeah. or um, a bar or a restaurant. He never owned never a, a nightclub. I see. And my father never went dancing, although he was a good dancer. He would dance, uh, you know, at family parties, sure. or uh, if I, when we went to uh, stay uh, to greet the new year with him. We, he would dance with me every once in a while. That was a, a, a sacred thing. New Year's Eve, everybody had to be at home with the family. Absolutely. You could then go out and have a good time, or we had a good time with our families. You could then go out with your friends after you greeted the New Year's with your family. And there was a tradition where you would mop the floors, and then with the dirty water, you would throw it out the door or out the window or in the toilet. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Of course, if you threw it out, out the window <laughs> or something, you had to make sure nobody was in the area. That's right. But That's that right. was our tradition, plus banging on, pot, uh, banging on pots and blowing, uh, you know, uh, instruments or whatever. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, do you remember um, after you were in the Bronx, um, um, what are some things that you did for fun with friends when you were, you know, say a child or teenager? Well, the only, if I went to the movies, we went to the Spanish movies and I went with my cousins. Uh, if I went to an American movies, which was seldom, sure. I went with my younger brother. but. You know that wasn't that wasn't one of the things that we did. Sure. And as I said, and it, family, it was family parties. Uh, very seldom. I think only in college did I finally go out to uh, other people's houses for uh, parties, uh, or I'd go to a jazz, uh, you know, nightclub, or because I wanted to hear jazz or something like that. But. Um, it was very restricted, and I was chaperone. We were all chaperone. Sure. You know, we chaperone. We chaperone each other. Sure. But we all, uh, you know, it wasn't as if. And then there, I never slept in anybody's house except my cousins. Sure. I mean, that was not something that you did. Sure. So, we never slept in anybody's house. We didn't have ice cream and uh, cakes or uh, popcorn or candy. In the house, uh, you know, you could. It was not something necessary, and it was not something that we could actually afford. We Absolutely. had to buy with the money we had. We had to buy food. Absolutely. And ice cream was not a food. That's right. That's right. Um, were either of your parents or other members of your family very religious? 
that you remember? Not really. No, yeah. not really. They they weren't. Uh, we would go to church and we did. We went. Everybody got confirmed. Uh, communion. My mother m made a lot of uh, my cousin's dresses and my own dress. Sure. Um, but no, we weren't really. You know, we we weren't really all that religious. Sure. I mean, you know, yeah. Um, now you've mentioned elementary school and junior high. Um, do you want to talk some about your high school experience? I know there's a couple high schools to mention there. Well, when I went to high school, as I said, I, I went at first to the Bronx School of, I had, I don't know how I, I think it was on my, um, what are they, your, on my record, my school record. Yeah. I basically, I can't remember, I don't know if I applied or it was sent uh, to the high schools. And they chose and, you, maybe. Yeah, I really don't, re that much I don't know. Um, sure. And I, and I don't remember, frankly, but I remember that I went to the Bronx School of Science, which at that point was on 186th Street. That's right, that's right. Uh, in the Bronx between Jerome mm -hmm. and I think Walton Avenue. Yep. Jerome and Walton. It was an old building. Uh, at that point, it wasn't so old, but it's old now. Yeah. And it's not a high school, I mean, it's not the Bronx School of Science. Bronx School of Science moved up to where Lehman College That's is right. or Hunter College. Um, but I went there, and, <clears throat> and I remember when I walked into the door, um, well, that was okay. But when I went to my classroom and sat down, <laughs> I was the only Puerto Rican in the class. Mm -hmm. And probably at that point, the darkest, because I get very dark after the summer. Sure. And in September, this, I showed up in September. And I remember the teachers had looked at me and she said, are you in the right school? And I said, well, I think so. Uh, and then, and then she couldn't pronounce my name. Mm -hmm. I remember it was uh, Peretta. I can't even remember. Perita, Perita. Perita. And then it was Rodriguez. And I said, my name is not Perita, and it certainly isn't Rodriguez. It's Peretta <laughs> and Rodriguez. Okay, but I was, I remember uh, <laughs> when I graduated from elementary school, as I said, uh, they called my name several times in terms of one of the girls poked me. She said, I think they're talking about you, Peretta. That's you. So I went up and I got, you know, elementary school. Well, and junior high school was probably the same. And high school was horrendous, as I said. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't complete the whole year. I transferred then. I, you know, I said, I just want to get out of here because, I mean, it was horrible. Yeah. So I went to Walton High School, which was not any better, which mm -hmm. I said to you, Dr. Payne, it was going from the frying pan into the fire. Um, and to this day, I don't go to any of the reunions sure. in either school. Why would you go someplace when you can't stand it? That's I right. mean, That's right. I don't have any good memories of high school. That's right. Um, all I remember was, I remember um, um, in Walton, I remember every day I'd be waiting for my friend Lydia, who was, she was the second Puerto Rican. There was three of us. Wow. One was in, in, in uh, a senior, which I never met. The second one was my friend Lydia Sanchez, who was in the, um, I think she was in a sophomore. Uh -huh. And I was a, a freshman. And I remember we would meet each other on, uh, on Kingsbridge, the station there, and I would be crying. Mm -hmm. And she would say, no, that's okay, we'll get, we'll manage this, let's go home together. We'd go home together, and then um, in the morning, I'd come, go to school reluctantly, and then at the end of the day, I would be sitting on the bench on Kingsbridge Road, Kingsbridge Station, and I would be crying again. Mm -hmm. And one of the examples was, for instance, um, this pr uh, teacher had said to me, uh, I was uh, monitoring the classroom, 
and uh, there were people who were talking. And so when the professor came in, he said, well, how was the class? And I said, well, this one and this one was talking, and this one and that one was doing this. But, you know, that's what I, and he said something to me like, look at the frying pan, call, no, what was it? Look at the frying pan, look at the, uh, look at the frying pan or something or other. And I had never heard of that uh, saying. Yeah, uh, sure. And I still can't remember what it was, but he said, but something about the frying pan. Uh -huh. So <laughs> everybody I knew, I asked, do you know what this is, what this means? Because the professor said he called me. Look at the frying pan, calling the something the kettle. Look at the frying. Oh, that's what it was. Look at the frying pan, calling the kettle black. Ah. Okay. I had never heard that. So I asked everybody I knew. Do you know what looking look at the frying pan, calling the kettle black? Nobody knew. Sure. And so it finally dawned on me. Everybody I was asking were Puerto Ricans. Uh -huh. I didn't know any white, you know, Caucasian friends or even Jewish friends. Sure. And then one day I had, the, a year later, I had the nerve to ask this Jewish girlfriend, what does look at the frying pan calling the kettle black? She said, Peretta, that's like people who live in glass houses should not throw, should not throw stones. So I went to the professor because I still was in the school, I said, well, you had asked me to be a monitor, and you said to report what people were doing. And he looked at me as if to say, are you crazy? What are you talking about? Mm -hmm. I said, well, you called me, look at the, the kettle calling the, the uh, uh, something or the kettle black. And I said, and that's what I was doing. You, I was following your instructions. Yeah, yeah. But he looked at me as if to say, Who's this crazy kid? Mm. One year later, I, I all of a sudden was able to understand what he said. Sure. So th that was that was an incident also. That was before that was after, no that was before my uh, my uh, mother's friend came. The lawyer came to school to tell the Pines counselor that I was not going to be changed uh, into an, uh, a commercial. That if he did that, he would sue her personally. Ah, wow. So yeah. you stayed on the academic track. Yeah. That's great. Wow. So, and then, but, uh, you know, in some way she had her revenge. Yeah. Because uh, at that time when I went to City College, they had two days of exams to qualify to get into school. Uh -huh. And um, she had given me, they, there were two days, she only gave me one of the days. And therefore, uh -huh. I only showed up mm. for one day of the of the exam. The other day, I was never there. Sure. And so I got into the college uh, with my the marks that I got from the from one exam. I st wow. still don't remember what it was, whether it was English or something or other. But I know it wasn't the math class. Uh, at that point, I was going to become a chemist. Ah, uh, okay. I and see. so uh, when I started. I started at night because I had to work until, uh, as I said to you, no, I, I didn't say. I had to work the first two years in the evening, and I worked at Metropolitan Life Insurance Company. That's uh -huh. another story to tell you. After I graduated, I went to work for uh, the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company, and uh, you had to take an exam also. I was the only, room, only person in the room who took the exam, and uh -huh. the lady when she marked it, she looked at me and she said, is this your exam? <laughs> so I said to her, well, I'm the only one that's sitting in the room. So yes, it's mine. Oh. <laughs> anyway, to make a long story short, I ended up working in the mail room at, uh -huh. at uh, you know, at uh, Metropolitan Life Insurance Company until about a year later then I uh, talked to someone or did something and I, I got to work in the actuarial department, um, <laughs> doing something there. But at least sure. I learned that when you would die, what age you would die, from what you would die from, <laughs> you know, because that's the kind of actuarial work that uh, they did at that time. Uh, but, you know, that was my first job. Wow. Wow. So you did that for your first two years at yeah. City College. Yeah, while wow. I was in college. Wow. And then, as I said, then I spoke to my father and I said, 
you know, I can't, uh, this is going to take me forever. I need to go to school in the daytime. Sure. So that's when my father said, okay, uh, I'll pay you. And my mother, Chip, my mother, they both worked on getting me uh, in the daytime. I see. I see. Because um, that involved, you know, car fare and, and money for breakfast, or absolutely. not for breakfast, money for lunch. Sure. And I would take classes at night, so it meant money for lunch and money for dinner. Aha, uh -huh, absolutely. And what, um, did you stay with chemistry the whole time at City College, or did you change your course no, of study? No, no, I changed. Uh, basically, basically, I it was two, I was... A, a chemist for two years. I okay. took classes for two years, which was, so I took algebra and geometry. I took all the math and some science. And then a guidance counselor told me there, and she said, well, you know, you're Puerto Rican, you're female, and you're dark. I don't think you're going to have very many opportunities to work in the field. Mm -hmm. So I, my, my father had said to me, you know, I'm paying your way for you to get a degree to get a job. So I said, well, I better find something to get, a, you know, to do, to be able to get a job in. And so I majored in sociology and psychology because uh, they had jobs there and, um, oh, and Spanish. Okay, sure. I didn't want to become a teacher. That because my other cousins were, were teachers. And one, one ended up being a principal at, What's, what's today the School of Math and Science in Manhattan, I see. right near the East River Drive. She sure. was a principal there. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, did you get involved in any student clubs or activities while you were at City College? Not really, because, um, you know, I had to... Uh, you know, I had to go... I had to keep my marks up sure. in terms of City College. Um, and I had I worked and I, I and I go to and I went to classes and then I went uh, I stopped working went to classes but take took classes in the daytime and in the evening so I would be finished fast but um, and I didn't get involved too much in terms of the politics at the school sure. it's after I graduated that I gave support to the um, they made a film in terms of uh, the open enrollment. Yes, yes. I gave uh, a great, tremendous amount of support to the students that were doing that, um, and um, and some other things I did. I can't remember. But at that time, open enrollment. There was uh, students boycotting that. Then they were boycotting. Uh, the School of Medicine to get the School of Medicine at City College to open it, open up the enrollment uh -huh. so that minorities were able to become students there. At, at that point, uh, there was also Lincoln Hospital had a strike in terms of community medicine that I participated in. Uh -huh. Okay, the, the, at, at uh, Lincoln Hospital. Then um, I think that was it. Yeah, those. Those were some of the major strikes that was happening at that point. Sure, sure. Um, and at what around what year did you um, start interning at United Bronx Parents? You interned that there, was, I think, right? Yeah, that was when I was in uh, junior high school. Oh, high school, okay. Junior okay. high school 60. Because junior see. high school 60 was on Intervale. Uh -huh. And a United Parents Association was close. It was sure. either on Intervale or close to it. Sure. So I did that, you know, in terms of having it as an intern. And I worked there, um, I think, one year, basically working with parents, you know, I see. in terms of representation uh, for them to become more uh, active in terms of their children's uh, education, uh, Parents Teachers Association. Sure, yeah. sure, sure, sure. And did you get to know Dr. Evelyn Antonetti very of well? Of course. I, sure. Well, not very well, but I got to know her because I worked for her. Sure. And, you know, as an intern, I worked there. And she was very, very inspirational. There was no question about it. And, you know, if you, the parents' uh, parents' uh, involvement in parent-teacher's education, I mean, you have to understand, you, 
you had to practice, help them practice, in, you know, speaking in English. Absolutely. You had to practice getting them to feel confident enough to speak at those meetings. Sure. Even if they had, I mean, even if they had accents like my mother, my mother never lost her accent, her accent, which is a whole story in itself. Sure. I'll tell you afterwards. But she, um, but the, the, I mean, when you went to, at that time, at Evelina, when we went, when I was there as an intern, it worked with, you know, helping the parents speak English so that they could get their ideas across in English to uh, how to make sure that they were counted in terms of that they showed up to the meeting, that they stayed at the meeting, that sure. they participated. Three, that they knew how to handle uh, conferences, uh, the, the annual or biannual conference uh -huh. in terms of their, their children's progress at the school. I mean, all of those kinds of things is what you were teaching uh, uh, the Puerto Rican uh, mothers and fa ba basically mothers sure. how to participate and become involved in their children's education. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, uh, how long were you? Uh, did you intern at United Brown? It, it was about a year. About a year. I yeah. see. I see. Um, so. After you finished at City College, um, where did your life take you at that point? That in itself is also an interesting thing. I, 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 didn't, owe, I didn't owe any money in terms of, because um, uh, it was free. It was free. Still, the only right? thing is that you had to pay for your books. Yeah. And we had a method by which we'd all sit at one table and so uh, many times during the evening when I had no money and no lunch, the veterans that came back, they, they would be sitting there and they would all give me a little bit of their food. Uh -huh. So that's how I was able to eat dinner. But I always had coffee to go into come. So I had coffee, but they would give me a, a dinner. And I always brought a sandwich, so I had lunch. Um, and when I graduated, I owed money to family members. I don't think I owed anybody any money, but just sure. my family members. And so, you know, I had to find a way to pay for them. And uh, at that point, I was working for Mount Sinai uh -huh. in the, uh, so, in the uh, social work department because I had my degree in sociology as well as psychology. And when I went to school, um, a couple of months after working at... Mount Sinai, what happens? 1199 has a strike. Uh-huh. <laughs> 1199 has a strike and Peretta owes money. And Peretta has two family members that union organizes. Uh -huh. So do you think that Peretta was going to cross the union no picket way. line? No way. No way. <laughs> and I would ask, well, I said, well, if I get up early enough, they won't be, they won't be the picket <laughs> line and I can go across. I, I don't have to walk across the picket line. I can get there early. Nobody's on the, uh, uh, nobody's picketing. So I can go and go and work and, and get some money and pay everybody. <laughs> Forget it. It never happened. No matter how early I got there, there was always one person or two or three people. So I ended up <laughs> still owing people money and then still, you know, whatever it was. Then um, the, when, when the union, when, the, when it was over, uh, I, went, I went back to work. But basically what they did was the, the people who, I mean, the people that I knew in the sociology, in the social work uh, unit, basically what they did was when the union was over, they worked a little bit longer, and then they all left. They got different uh -huh. jobs in different places. I would just think, I, I think because it was uh, so disappointing uh, in terms of how the union uh, and how the management, uh, you know, treat, treated union workers. Yeah. But, it, you know, I mean, uh, Dennis Rivera did a tremendous job in terms of the organizing of 1199. And if we still have a strong 1199, it was because of the principles that he laid down yeah. and the people that were organizing at that point. And as I told you, 
Uh, it was years later when I was in Washington, D.C. My mother was still working, and she was working for Metropolitan uh, Life, uh, Metropolitan, Hos Metropolitan Hospital, and they were organizing to have 1199 come in. And my mother, of course, union organizer, became part of the union, union organizing for 1199 as well. Wow. Wow. So how, how long were you at Mount Sinai yourself? I think I couldn't have been more than, I know it was a year. I might have been a year or two years. Yeah. And I think I worked from, I, went, I left there and I think I worked for the, um, the Protestant, um, there was a large Protestant agency like Catholic Charities, the okay, Protestant, sure. I forget now, something or other. And I, I remember working there for about two years, and, and something interesting was it, it, I would be recording at some of the meetings of the board of the United Protestant Welfare Agencies uh -huh, or something uh -huh. like that. And I remember one time I went to a meeting, and they were all saying uh, how... They had no money and they didn't know the board was saying, members board was saying they didn't have any money and how were they going to raise uh, to do this project or raise that project. And my supervisor and myself were, you know, recording the meeting. And I, I thought I whispered to him, boy, we really are in bad shape. If these people who came over with the Mayflower, if they don't have any money, What's what's going to happen with, with the rest of us? Well, evidently, my my whisper was not a whisper, <laughs> and because I have a full voice, as you can hear, and so one of the two, one or, one or two board members got very offended, and they spoke to the supervisor, mm -hmm. and the supervisor came in and had a, so I had a meeting with him, and he said, Peretta. Some, some of the board members heard you speak, uh, and they got very offended. And I said, well, I don't know why they got offended. I mean, when you have somebody who wears a $300 suit, I mean, a $300 shirt, a $500 shoe, and he tells you that he doesn't have any, have any money, what's the rest of us going to do? Where, I mean, where, is the re where are the rest of us? How, how can we have any money? And he said, well... Uh, you won't be recording any more meetings. Mm. So I, never, I, I did organizing, but I, I didn't do, you know, any of that. No, I see. No, no more meetings. I see. Um, <laughs> and where did you go after that? I know you, I know well, you eventually I ended up in with, D.C., but not yet. Yeah, right? no, I stayed with uh, United, uh, 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 United Protestant Welfare Agency. I think that's what it was. And I got a job with Catholic Charities, Catholic Guardian Society. And after a year or two with them, uh, they gave me a scholarship to go and study for my master's degree at Fordham University, I which see. was on around 40th Street between Lexington and 3rd Avenue. Uh -huh. And was that what? Right? Yeah, Ca no, Catholic Guardian Society, when I first went to work for them, where they were on... 23rd Street, no, 23rd, 22nd, 23rd, 22nd Street between Lexington and Gramercy Park. I see. And Catholic Guardian Society was in there also. And uh, that's where, so I went from the Protestant Welfare Agency, which was on 22nd Street, right on Madison Avenue, no, right on Lexington uh -huh. Avenue. I went across, I turned the corner, I went down the street, and I went to work for Catholic Charities. Wow. So how, how was your time um, in the graduate program at The graduate Fordham? program was pretty good. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I made some, made one or two good friends. Um, uh, I didn't, I never really had, I, most of the friends I had in City College were uh, other Puerto Rican students and some of the veterans. Sure. I didn't make friends with any, uh, you know, with anyone, you know, really there other than them. Yeah. And I remember when I went to City College, 
I said, oh my God, this is like a, a, a going to a candy store. Look at all these candies. And I meant, look at all these people, different races, uh -huh. different religion, uh -huh. different heights. I mean, it was, City College was wonderful. Yeah. It was an absolutely wonderful school. And <clears throat> when I went to City College, I mean, the education was so good um, <clears throat> and so thorough that, um, I mean, it, it's, it, 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 it made me who I am, to tell you the truth. Sure. It was a, and at that point, Sid College, uh, Colin Powell was, I can't remember, I think he was, he was in the ROTC, mm -hmm. but I don't remember if he was a year ahead of me or what. But I remember uh, one, of, uh, one of the group that they had, because they had a black group sure. within the R ROTC, one of the young men asked me uh, to come. I was invited for dinner, for, you know, when they were at a restaurant, which was right on uh, Amsterdam Avenue. Okay, yeah. And uh, that was nice. Yes. Yeah. Wow. But I, I, I knew I, I knew of him, and we said hello, but we I, we never were very friendly in terms sure. of. Um, I was more in friends with one or two of the other people in his group. Sure. Because one of them happened to be a boyfriend of mine. Sure, sure, sure. And and he he went to Morris High School. Yes. Himself and yeah, a lot of Bronx I know. My brother went there. to Morris High School also. Ah, I see. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Um, I see. So yeah, I'm sure City College must have been a very different experience for you, you know, coming from a place where you're one of three Puerto Ricans to City College. Oh my God. Well, we were very few in numbers also, but okay, at least sure. I, I, I would say that if there were a hundred, you know, Puerto Ricans, mostly Puerto Ricans, there was Costa Rican, there was uh, some others from Central America, but most of us were Puerto Ricans. Sure. And then if we were 100, maybe the blacks were 200. Sure. It was sure. A, 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 a drop in the bucket, really, yes. at Absolutely. that point. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and what about the, the Fordham Graduate School of Social Work? Um, um, what was that like at the time? It was wonderful as well. But, you know, again, uh, I was maybe one, one of, one of uh, no, there were two of us. Okay, sure. Uh, Ruth Sanchez became, uh, went to Washington, D.C., and she became the head at one point of the National Institute of Drug Abuse. Oh, wow. Okay. Alcohol and drug abuse. She became, uh, she married a very uh, famous and potential um, pres uh, uh, legislator in the um, a legislator in, in you know in Washington D.C. Okay, uh, I see. Her, her husband was very very famous, very well known, uh, and I think that had a lot to do with her being able to get that kind of a job. Sure, sure. And I was a program officer and a contract officer uh, with the National Institute of Mental Health. I see. Was was that based in D.C.? Is that when you were in D.C.? Yes, that was when I became an HHS. That's when I, I went to HHS as a White House fellow. But we, we need to get to course, that another, yeah. That's another little, time. Yeah. Um, so... Uh, I think, well, let, let me check with you, is, is a natural stopping point um, right before you move to D.C., or do you want to stop now? How are you feeling? I think I'm getting a little bit tired. I have yeah. to go to the bathroom. Okay, sure, sure. So I think we should stop.